so my name is uh, Jose Luis Escanciano, and I work as a backend engineer here at William Hill. And I'm really that passionate about reactive system and distributed systems as well. So I'm, what I'm trying to achieve with this talk is that I can uh, share with you some of the knowledge that I have uh, I, I have got during the last couple of years. Um, so. First, I'm pretty sure that many people here uh, have heard about the word reactive, right? So if you can please just hands up who has ever heard of that. Yeah, so yeah, given there are so much people that have already heard, maybe I can just go away. Yeah, anyway, so uh, what I want to say uh, with this slide is uh, why this reactive word emerged, why there are so many people that is interested in these reactive things. So if you have a look backwards, what used to happen a few years ago is that our customers used to go to the, to the shop. So uh, the timeline for the shop to open is like 9 o'clock in the morning, let's say 9 o'clock in the evening, something like that. And we give our services to our customers during that time frame, uh, roughly speaking. Of course, during the night, there are like uh, different processes for, I don't know, accountability or whatever thing happening. Uh, but let's say uh, we have like a big time frame of react of react to potential failures that can happen uh, to prepare our systems in a way that are ready for the next day, something like that. Uh, time passes, and what happens is our business and uh, with the internet coming uh, wants to offer the services online, right? So. Now, the thing is that you don't open anymore from 9 to 9, so your time frame is bigger. So you need to offer your services during a uh, more period of time. And if you, ha if you have a look at what usually happens with the different companies is that they start uh, offering their services to a uh, quite reduced uh, population, let, let's say just one given country. But then as soon as they are like uh, uh, they are successful in their business, they start to uh, grow up. And what happens is that they offer their services worldwide. So now you have a business that is running 24 hours a day during the whole year. And you have like less, less time to maneuver in terms of uh, having any kind of uh, downtime or whatever for, uh, to adapt your system to that. Alongside with that, uh, what has been happening also is that the technology has evolved, uh, given these demands from the customers and these needs from the business. So where we started with just one single CPU with one core, now we have uh, machines with uh, uh, multiple cores, multiple CPUs, and also the way of deploying our systems has changed a lot because we used to have like a big monolith uh, deployed in single machines. Um, then we started to spread our system in different components, like within the same uh, com in, in our company. Uh, so our company itself was owning the, the hardware and was deploying everything there and serving the customers. And nowadays what is happening is that there are companies that are serving cloud services for other companies to deploy their services there and uh, finally uh, offer these services to the, uh, to the customers. So the only thing that is missed in this slide is the software, right? The software has also evolved. And right now, where we had like uh, monolithic systems uh, that uh, were not really data-driven or anything, uh, we want to give a response to the new needs for our business and also our customers. So that's one of the reasons why these reactive words emerged. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, what reactive systems are. So essentially, a reactive system is a distributed system that fulfill all of those properties that you see in the screen. Uh, the first one is uh, being responsive. And being responsive means that that system has to give an, an answer in a timely manner, because if it fails to do so, uh, is the same as if it's not serving any answer. So potentially, and as Tomaso was saying, when uh, you had like an animation that was really slow, that that kind of unresponsiveness will frustrate our customers and potentially make our customers go away and find something else. Also, we want to be responsive in a way that our data uh, drives what we offer to the client. So let's say, for example, in a betting company, uh, when a match starts, you can offer, for example, Messi to score the first goal. 
but by the time uh, Messi scores the, third, the first goal, there's no, uh, there's no, uh, there's no reason for offering that first goal to be scored by Messi because he has already scored that. So you need to react and you need to change what you offer to your customers into maybe Messi to score the second goal or the other team to tie uh, uh, anything. But essentially, we want to achieve responsiveness. And that responsiveness has to come in different flavors because uh, we are pretty sure and we all have suffered from different bugs going on in production, even, even though that we have tested our code as much as possible. That always happens. And we need to be responsive anti, uh, and under those failure scenarios. Um, how do we achieve this? So I think the, the main way to achieve this is by having the, uh, the, re the error always in, uh, in mind when we design our system. So we have to embrace the error as part of our design, and we have to kind of uh, potentially isolate uh, what our failures can be. So for example, if a subsystem in our uh, whole uh, distributed system fails, maybe we want to use patterns like circuit breakers to uh, to avoid uh, overflowing that system when it comes back up and stuff like that. <coughs> the other property that we want to achieve with reactive systems is that those reactive systems are elastic in the sense that they are uh, responsive under different, uh, different amount of loads. Um, that can be, uh, let me put up an example here. Uh, the load of your system is not going to be ever constant. It, it's going to change. Why? Because, uh, for example, in the betting industry, you can, uh, you can guess that on a Saturday afternoon, there's a lot more clients coming into the, uh, the web page because uh, their teams are playing the matches. So you, you're going to have to serve much more clients. But also, it's not just that. It's the, the, the data that is coming into your backend is going to grow as well exponentially. Because if normally, let's say, but this time now, there will be like, Few ma football matches on the on the main on, on the main leagues, but during a Saturday afternoon there will be lots of matches and there will be lots of price changes. So if you put those things together, that might might end up on you needing to have or spin off more nodes of your different services in order to serve that amount of load. And uh, finally, message driven because that's an enabler for. Uh, this responsiveness. And we are going to see now, uh, for example, in the next slide, that this applies to also to reactive programming in the way that uh, traditionally we were using synchronous blocking APIs where we were uh, misusing our resources. Like, for example, if you see in this example, you have one thread here that is doing a blocking call to another thread. So when that thread finishes, it comes back to the first one. But th that time, the first one is still under use. It's like a passive, uh, it's like an uh, uh, active wait. Uh, that doesn't happen if we go into a non-blocking asynchronous API where we free our thread until uh, we get response back. Um, so reactive programming has uh, a lot to do with the reactive system, but it's more applies to your single, node, your single nodes and how you get the maximum out of your resources in your machine. So uh, the, main, the main goal to achieve in reactive programming also is that uh, your, your flow of execution depends on your data, and it's not just a fixed uh, order of uh, um, control statements. Um, that, that data uh, comes in the flavor of events that are going to be emitted by uh, publishers and going to be consumed by one or multiple uh, observers. So, and also the best thing of this way of, solving, of approaching the problems is that you can uh, fine grain them or divide them, split them in uh, smaller pieces, and then you can execute them asynchronously. Uh, that for sure improves readability, performance, and resource efficiency. Um, of course, sometimes also increase the complexity. Um, I'm going to introduce now uh, what uh, Serjan was talking before, uh, and it's a computational model that is called the actor model, invented by uh, Carl Hewitt back in the 70s. 
So in this computational model, all your domain is designed as an actor. Everything is represented as an actor. Uh, that means that it is the fundamental uh, unit of computation. And as such, it has to embody the computation, means the statements that needs to be executed, the storage, that means the uh, you want an actor to have memory in the sense that you want to uh, you want to deal with uh, different mutation mutations kind of uh, during time um, uh, communication as well because you want the actors to communicate to each other. Um, if you have a look uh, at the different implementations, they're always uh, uh, talking about a mailbox uh, on the actor. But uh, as Carl Hugh was saying, uh, there shouldn't be such thing as a mailbox in this model, in the theoretical model, because then you should uh, you should need to use an actor to represent that, and and there you get into a recursion, and that's that's not feasible. So what he came up with is with the, those actions, which are essentially what the the actor can do. So the actor can do three things, which is when executing uh, uh, when executing calls up up on a given message, he can create other actors. He can pass messages to other actor and also can designate what to do with the next message it receives. But doesn't doesn't talk about anything where the message is put in order to be received or anything. And if you are a fan of program uh, functional programming, uh, that means that you can designate which is the function that is going to be executed when you receive the next uh, message. Uh, now down to the implementation. Uh, ACA is one of the implementations on the on the JVM for the actor model. Um, it uh, essentially is pretty easy to use. As you can see down there, that's an example of how you create you can create an actor, and it models is in a way that uh, the actor represents the unit computation. There's one mailbox attached to it, each actor that is gonna uh, is gonna materialize that part where Carl is saying that. Uh, the actors can send messages to each other. That's the, the way to, a tangible way to put the messages in, into somewhere for the actor to be processed. And also, the actor has an isolated state. So that's one thing that you need to respect when you, when you program your, your actors. If you have some, some state that has to be isolated, do not expose to the, to the outside world unless you exchange messages in order to get information from it. Uh, if you remember the principles of reactive system, that means that ACA by design is message driven. Um, the next concept that uh, ACA, ACA has, has is essentially the dispatchers. Um, given the, the actor has the actor has really little memory footprints, they're on the in the order of kilobytes. So you're gonna have way more actors than threads. And what does it mean? That uh, you need to avoid blocking. That's what you are gonna, uh, you're going to see in all the documentation. Do not block, do not block. Why is that? That is because if you see this thread, this thread is going to execute something in some message for this actor, and then we'll jump to another one to execute some other thing, and then we'll jump to another one to execute one thing. So if this one blocks here, that's you are preventing this thread from executing code in other, different, in other, in other actors. So that's the reason for that. Uh, I think I don't have it there, but uh, these patchers execute the actor's code, and they are in the in the shape of uh, abusing of the language uh, thread pools. So you can essentially dimension size the thread pools and tune it accordingly to improve the the throughput of your execution. Uh, again, if you remember about the the reactive principles, this is. Uh, this is an enabler for uh, responsive overall. Uh, one quite important thing about ACA uh, is that, uh, of course, uh, the actors on the actor system are a hierarchical structure. And what, it, what is implemented here with the supervision is that your, the parent actor is supervising the children in a way that you can react to failures upon that upon uh, uh, when the code is executed on the on the children so you can think of this for example this is like a company structure a structure you will have like different managers um, 
they are responsible to do some work, but also can leverage some other work to different workers, so the people that is within the team. So whenever one worker has any problem, like for example, I'm given a task and I don't know how, how to fulfill it. So I'm gonna do something like, uh, well, I don't know how to do this, and then I escalate uh, to, my, uh, to my supervisor. And then the guy can say, okay, you know what? Uh, better go home, tomorrow come back and try to execute it again. Or do not give, a, uh, do not give importance to this task and then execute the next one. Uh, for example, can say, you know what? I'm, I'm tired of you, I'm gonna sack you and uh, I'm gonna hire a new one. And eventually the manager does not, any, does not know how to react to that either. So I say, okay, I have to escalate to my manager and so on and so forth. So, the good thing of that is that um, you can also design your system in a way that you as isolate the failures, for example, here and here. So failures on this manager one does not afflict to failures on this manager two. And that also applies within the actor system and within other nodes as well. Um, yeah, as I, I note there, uh, there's other way of uh, super, not supervision, but monitoring is when, for example, uh, you want to know the life cycle of, of another actor when it dies and react to that uh, fact, then you can do that. And this is not restricted to the parent-child relationship. So essentially, there could be potentially this manager watching this worker, uh, potentially. Um, uh, regarding to the link to the reactive principles, this is an enable for uh, resiliency. Finally, another feature that ACA provides is that you can form cluster clusters out of your individual nodes. So the only thing that uh, you need to you need to do is you, is you need to change the implementation of uh, which is the, the let's say the creator of the actors if you, if you allow me this abuse of the language, and then all those nodes are gonna start to gossip together in order to choose a leader. And then the responsibility of that leader is a normal, a normal node, but the, the extra responsibility that it has is to take decision on, their, on, on, the, on the membership side. So for example, if one node is unreachable, that can be is unreachable because it's doing a long GC pause, or it can be unreachable because there's a network split or something, he's kind of the, the guy in charge to take the decision on whether to take him away or or to accept new nodes or something like that into the cluster. Um, that's of course is an enable for elasticity. And um, I haven't talked about this, but this is quite important property on ACA, is that the location transparency. Uh, whenever you decide any actor system, you, des you design it in a way that is potentially distributed. You, know, you don't think that it's gonna be local first and then distributed. You think of it like it could, if it was distributed on the first time, and there will be really no difference at all because when you create an actor, you're giving back a reference to that actor, and that doesn't really change uh, either way if it's a local actor or, or, a, or a distributed actor. Um, now, these are few patterns that ACA provides with you with this clustering solution. Uh, for example, you can have a cluster singleton which refers to uh, a special type of actors that will live only in one node. Uh, the implementation is a bit different because there will be a singleton coordinator in each node of the cluster and then the incarnation of the actual actor will be just happening in, in one node. Cluster sharding is what is illustrated in the picture that you can have, for example, you can divide your, domi your domain in different segments and assign one or more segments to each one of the nodes, so you distribute the load according to a has function. Uh, another one is distributed publisher subscriber uh, to, for example, broadcast or uh, do a pub subscribe in a distributed way. Doesn't really need to be broadcast. You essentially one node can subscribe to a particular topic, and then essentially when you publish something to that topic, it's going to be. Uh, sent to all those subscribers and so on and so forth. There are a couple of other more patterns implemented by ACA, like the distributed data, for example, that was experimental. I'm not sure if it's production ready yet, but yeah, uh, it makes your life quite easier. 
Uh, now I'm going to do a demo uh, where uh, what I'm going to set up is a three nodes cluster of ACA. Um, what they are going to do are reading messages from a Kafka broker. And depending on whether I publish the message to a topic broadcast or sharding, it, it's going to broadcast the messages using the, using the distributed publisher subscriber, or it's going to shard to different nodes in order to process. So let's hope everything goes fine with this. So first, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, start my Zookeeper and Kafka here. And then I'm going to start an application. I don't know if I'm running out of time. But if we, if we have time, I can show you some code if you want afterwards. So yeah, each one of those terminals is uh, a different node. They are all running in my, uh, in my local computer. But it could be potentially in different in different machines. Okay, so now the cluster is gonna be set up and established. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna produce messages to this broadcast topic, and you're gonna see that uh, that message is gonna be uh, read by just one node, and then it's gonna be broadcasted to all of them. So broadcast this one, please. And then, as you see, uh, forget about this warning. This is because I haven't set up properly the serialization of the messages through the wire. But if you see, um, there should be some message that I'm missing right now about uh, when this one, ah, here it is. This is the log line that is printed when I read the, the message from Kafka. So as you see, there's just one node reading this message from Kafka, but it's broadcasted to uh, all of the nodes here. Right. And now I'm going to do a different test, which is uh, I'm going to show how this uh, sharding thing works. So this one is a little bit different. Uh, the aim of this one is just to distribute the, the, the load across your cluster. So what I use here is a, f a hash function on the, on the message payload. And depending on that hash, it's going to go to one node or, or another. So let's say one, for example. And if you see here, this guy read the message from Kafka and has sent to the shard region. And because of the hashing, it's going to be created on this node here. If I send two, it's essentially read, read again in this node, and it's sent to the local node because of the, of the hashing function. I'm going to type three, and then I get to the other machine down there. But if I type two, what do you expect to happen? So what do you expect is that given the, given the fact that this has the same, uh, it's going to have the same hash as this message two, is going to be delivered to the same uh, to the same node. Um, there we are. If you have a look, this is essentially the um, this is the address of each actor that is created under the Sandrin region, and at the end is this 76 is about the uh, uh, the shard uh, the shard ID, and then you have the name of the actor. There. Uh, Essentially that. I'm going to take down one node right now. For example, this one. Oh, sorry. I've just taken all of them. Because I was broadcasting, sorry. Just give it a moment. OK. Going to stop the broadcasting now. Let's try to do the same thing. One. Oh, brilliant. Um, mm -hmm. OK, one is received here. It took a little while to connect to Kafka. Then I'm going to send two. Um, sorry, one was received here. Two was received in this one. And then three, let's see where it is received. Three is received in this node. 
I'm going to send again one and should be receiving this one. Yes. Now I'm going to take down this one, right? Now, there we are. And then the cluster is going to rebalance all these shards. And essentially, if I send back one, right? Uh, if you see there in the logs, you see that the member is removed from the cluster. This is because I have auto toning uh, enabled that is just for this test, but should be not used in production. Um, if you see, I am receiving a message in the same node as before, one. I'm going to send another message, which was three, that was targeted for this one. So I should be receiving it here. There we are. And then if we send two, given this actor, uh, sorry, this node is down, it should be sent to one of the two, which is this one here. Right? Yep. There it is. Back to the presentation. And then the last thing I want to present to you uh, is uh, regarding this uh, related to this reactive is the reactive streams. Um, I'm going to introduce the problem that made reactive streams arise, and is the typical problem of the publisher subscriber. Will, where your subscriber, sorry, your publisher is really fast, and you and your subscriber is slow. It's the same as producer-consumer essentially. So if traditionally you use just push, so essentially is the the publisher is is taking control and pushing the messages to the to the subscriber. Uh, that's not a safe operation because uh, the consumer is going to be slow, and by the time he's processing this message here. He has already filled the buffer, and there's one that just go up from the buffer, and essentially the subscriber just dies or do something else, like for example, okay, just drop the message or whatever thing. If I just pull, is the subscriber that is in charge and basically has to pull the messages from the publisher or the producer. So what's the problem with that? That is really slow because of the overhead. So uh, essentially, the the solution to this problem is just to use a back pressure mechanism. So, but again, if you put a, a back pressure mechanism that can be either used just pulled or send a known ACK from the from the subscriber to the publisher, then you have like an overhead that you don't you don't want. Um, sometimes it, not always the subscriber can be slow. Sometimes maybe the subscriber can be uh, good enough to keep pace with the with the publisher. So in those uh, scenarios, you want to have uh, push uh, behavior instead of just pull. So the solution would be to have like a dynamic adjustment of uh, this pull and pu uh, push and pull mechanism. So reactive streams is just a, the response or the solution for for this kind of problem. So what reactive streams is about is. Uh, is, is about an asynchronous processing of streams of data in a with a non-blocking back pressure. So the data the data items flow from downstream. Um, the demand items, which be essentially the I'm for example a as a subscriber, I'm demanding like give me five uh, five messages because uh, I'm I'm pretty sure that I can cope with that, and then. By having these two flows in in both directions, you can potentially adjust whether now is 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 a push based uh, way of sending uh, sending data or a pull based of uh, requesting the data to the publisher. Um, again, the implementation for reactive streams uh, in ACA is called ACA Streams, which has a nice thing about uh, how it's designed. It, it's a little bit confusing at the beginning when you start to uh, to play with it, but still, the good thing is that you can have like the the blueprint of of how your uh, your stream is going to be processed, and after that, you you have this uh, like a graph, and then you say run, and what happens under the hood is that there are some optimization and also that materializes into different actors in the actor system being created and processing the stream as as you request on your blueprint. Um, I'm going to show you one quick demo about back pressure in, in, in ACA streams. Um, I'm going to use IntelliJ for this. Um, yeah. 
the basics of uh, can you see this very spider if I just put it this way? Uh, okay, fine. So the basics of the streams is, uh, of course, you can have uh, more complicated streams, but the basics is you can have a source that can be, for example, taken out from a uh, from a collection, or you can transform a a, a Kafka connection, and the, and the stream is going to be the, the flow of messages coming. And then you have the flow, which is the transformation that you make uh, to, this, uh, to the incoming source messages. Um, after that, you have what is called the sync, which is where those uh, the, the items of that stream after the transformation are going are gonna to go. Uh, that, again, in this case, is just executing some code uh, upon each message, it can be like a, a Kafka publisher, or it can be something that uh, stores the data into a database, or something, whatever implementation is done under the hood. And then your runnable graph is going to be the source uh, taken via the flow and into the sync materializer. This Keep right is about, uh, if you have a look at the types and you have some insight on, on, on Scala, you can see that you have this not used here and then you have this feature of done. So it's, uh, in stream you can uh, potentially get things out of the stream. So for example, um, if one of the things you can do with the stream is just uh, drop all the messages into an actor. But as I, said, as I said before, this is just a blueprint, so you don't have the actor reference of the actor before running it. So when you run it, if you keep whatever comes out from the, from the stream, uh, it's going to give you back the reference to that actor when it materializes. That's just an example. Uh, in this case, given I'm just executing some code, what I get back is a feature of Dawn that essentially this represents that the uh, a stream eventually can finish, either, either way, if it's a failure or if, for example, is uh, just I run out of items in my stream. That in this case is gonna what is gonna happen because I have limited uh, inbound messages, which are coming from from this uh, from this collection here. And then, uh, yeah, I'm gonna talk about this transformation here. So these items, these integers from 1 to 20 are going to come downstream. The first thing I do with this is just, I, I do this just for visibility. There's another, there's another way of doing this, which is with, with a log, but uh, I, I prefer to do this way, uh, just for uh, you know, instruction purposes. Um, I'm going to log. Uh, this item is flowing downstream now. And then after that, I do, I'm going to do a map async because this is a, I, I wanted to do this way to illustrate that you can interoperate between streams and an actor, for example, or external systems. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm creating an actor before, before I have this, this stream created. And I'm going to send all the items coming downstream to this actor. And this actor is going to reply back with something. In this case, it's transforming an integer into a string. Um, it's going to do some nasty thing, some non uh, desirable thing here, which is, uh, well, sorry, I changed the code. I initially had it with a, with a block in the thread, but uh, just changed in a way that I'm scheduling the, the response message to be back within some, some delay. Uh, we're gl what we are going to see now is that the uh, the data starts to flow downstream, and I have this parallelism uh, cap to two. So essentially, it means this step here is going to emit a back pressure signal to the uh, to the previous publisher, let's say, when it gets to uh, when it gets to the top of those messages. So so when it has in that stage, there are like two messages that are not yet processed. It's going to send a signal back to back pressure. Um, uh, and the previous step is going to uh, slow down and don't send anything downstream until that, that's complete. So let's try it now. Uh, 
You see? So in this case, if you have a look at this function here, is essentially if the message, the idea of the message, well, the, uh, you know, uh, is um, if you divide the, the the ID by ten and you get the the result of that uh, uh, of that division and it's less than three, what is going to happen is it's going to delay the the response back. Otherwise, it's going to send back the response. So that means that the items one and two are going to take a while to uh, to be processed. So if you see, uh, there's item one and two flowing downstream, and then there's nothing else going downstream because the other step hasn't finished yet. And by the time this one is processed, then another message comes downstream and so on and so forth. It's not exactly, uh, I mean, it's not exactly like you see in the logs because there's some uh, kind of potential delay in the logging, but uh, essentially this is, this is how it is working. Uh, I presume that if we change this into something like this, it's going to be more visible, maybe. Because that means, you, you see, that the items goes flowing, back pressure in when they're, they're full, but the things start, uh, get, essentially, it got blocked for a while because uh, as the item is seven and I am, delating the, I am delaying the response based on the ID, uh, the response seven took like seven seconds in order to be uh, sent back, and that way the previous step was not sending anything downstream until that that phase was completed. Um, this pattern can be applied in 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 many different ways. Um, yeah, so I think this is pretty much everything I have to share with you. So if you have any questions, just uh, please ask anything.